see it come up on your screen if you have that second screen available you should see it we're gonna be live in one minute and five seconds guys come on bad pet come on the wrong one And just like that, we are back. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the last interview of 2022. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Welcome to episode 46. I mean, I cannot believe how the way we started. And now this is the very last interview of this year, the last Tuesday night of the year 2022. That's what I'm talking about. Heck yeah. But you know what? I'm not going to keep, you know, I'm not going to ramble on because we're here to have fun and turn up. And we're turning up tonight, episode 46. From the Manhattans, I'm talking about the one, the only, Mr. Gerald Austin. What's up, Gerald? How are you, Priscilla? How are you? All is good. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. <laughs> Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to, uh, New Year to you as well. How was your holiday? Beautiful, blessed. I had a wonderful, relaxing holiday. That's what's up. That's what's up. Now let me ask you: Is is this the first holiday that you are you usually performing on Christmas? No, usually after Thanksgiving we're off until um, probably more like. We're off used until Valentine's Day. So we were rehearsing, do a big rehearsal in January. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Yes. Welcome to that's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna happy holidays. Merry Christmas to everyone, all the fans that are watching. And Gerald, like I said, welcome to episode 46, the last episode of 2022. Can you believe that? Can you believe the year? We're done. We're almost about to ring in. Take go out with 2022 and bring in 22 2023. Can you believe that? It's it this year is gone so fast. It's unbelievable. You know, yes, we, we was we've been so busy. I guess when you're busy, you don't stop to really think about it as much. You know, and we, do before I became busy and everything. Let me ask you this this very first question because I like to ask artists. I know as a kid we all dream about that one thing. But when you were a young kid growing up, what was the one dream that you had? I wanted to sing. 
and because my father was a, before he passed, he was a singer. He was a pastor. My mother played piano and she sang with her sister and her sister-in-law. Yeah, that old boy bringing back the memories there. Um, <laughs> but I've always wanted to sing. I wanted to go to school, to be a doctor, art specialist. And when I met the Manhattans in 1970, I realized that was, even though I, I wanted, I realized that was truly my dream. And um, it was about to come true. So I started singing. So after I started singing with the Manhattans, I realized I was still sort of a hard doctor. You know, singing love songs, bringing happiness and joy to fans. Oh, wow. this picture! Oh. Oh God. <laughs> this picture of my mom and I was taken when I was inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame. Oh, boy. yes, that's what I'm talking. About. What was it like for you growing up in North Carolina compared to what North Carolina is today? What was it like for you growing up? For me growing up, um, we had a good life. We, the kids on the block that I live on, lived on, the kids would come out and play. Mm -hmm. um, we would we would go to church together. We it was a, a, a church in our community, St Andrew's Christian Church, and all the kids in the neighborhood went to that church uh, for Bible school, uh, Sunday school. Well, we and our families were members of different churches. And as we got older, we started going to the church that our families were, you know, uh, members of. But St. Andrews, we used to go there as a. I mean, Henderson. And everybody knew everybody. Everybody. And um, so it was like, it was a true community where the neighborhood helped raise the kids. You know, if you were wrong and got caught, and I mean, this is like a cliche, but if you were wrong and got caught by a neighbor, you were in trouble because they would get you just as quick as your parents would get you. And don't mention if, if you got it by a neighbor and you got home and a neighbor told your parents that they had to get you, that's another one, you know? <laughs> so, that's crazy that is crazy I mean that's how it was for you growing up in North Carolina that's what's up that is crazy do it make you just look back just now and appreciate how it was back then oh definitely definitely you know and when um, I started the first time that I performed in a talent show I was in the 7th grade and we had a principal, Mr. Williams, at the elementary school I was going to, middle school. And he was very strict, but he was a nice person, but he was very strict. And I'll never forget the English teacher that later became my English teacher. She came over and asked Mr. Williams, could I leave an hour earlier to go sing on a talent show, practice for a talent show, because everyone had talked about me singing. And he allowed me to go. And the first song that I sang in a talent show was Tennessee Waltz by Sam Cooke. I was dancing with my baby to the Tennessee Waltz where that old friend I happened, I happened to see won a talent show. That's what's up. Oh, man, that is crazy. Sing that way. Sing that again. I think, I think all the ladies got a little happy. With my baby to the Tennessee walls where that old friend I happen, I happen to see. Oh, yes. And I introduced him to my baby. And while they were dancing, my friend stole my sweetheart away from me oh yes he did oh god Ooh. it was i will always remember that song 
All right. Someone said that is a singing brother. A singing brother. That's what someone just said about you. You a singing brother. Go ahead and sing. All right. All right. That's what I'm saying. Someone said voice. Clap. Yes. Yes. All right. See? See? Everybody loving the voice. See? Now, from Sam Cooke, but wait, you grew up in the church. Was there ever a time you, re you received backlash from the church singer, suckler music? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Well, let me, let me take you back. My father was a pastor, and he sang with his uncles and nephews, and they had a group, group called the Gospel Brothers. And my uncle, the late Johnny Fields, he was one of the founding members of the Five Blind Boys of Alabama. So I grew up in gospel music, and I started singing. And I remember um, the pastor at St. Andrews, uh, was vis visiting with me at my uncle's house, and he was all over me. You singing the devil's music? You you used to be singing for the Lord, and I told him, you know, he was all over me. I said, I never stopped singing for the Lord, and then my uncle said, Wait a minute, Rev. Let me just explain something. He said God gave him a voice to sing, and as long as he's doing what God asked of him, bringing joy, happiness, and and good feelings to people, raising people up in the spirit, whether it's R&B or whether it's gospel, he's doing the will that God has bestowed upon him. And after he told him that, then Reverend kind of sat there and kind of came down and he cooled out. But he was all over me for a while with that. And I've heard other people um, speak about singing gospel, you know, you straddling the fence, you know, and, um, but I've learned, just like my uncle said and my father said the same thing, as long as you bring in joy and happiness to people doing what you're doing, you were blessed with that voice, use it. And as long as you're bringing joy and happiness to people, you're doing exactly what God gave, gave it to you. Yes. Do you ever feel, just saying that, do you feel sometimes, like you say, you want to be a singer, but do you feel the talent pick you or did you pick the talent? Uh, I think the talent picked me. Um, I've always been able to sing. Uh, and um, my mother used to, told me, used to tell me when I was a kid that I would stand in, I couldn't walk too well. I had, um, had to wear braces. And um, she said, I was standing, I would stand up in the bed and I would just sing different little songs, gospel songs, but I would sing. And I've always been like that. Um, I remember in high school, when I would come home from a football game, basketball game, I'll be coming home by myself. And I walked through, we had little cut throughs, we shortcuts, we call them. And I walked through by people's houses, and I'll be singing. And they, and I've had neighbors tell me, if I didn't hear you sing, I knew something was wrong. Something was going on because I would always come the same way and I'd always be singing some song when I pass through different places, you know, shortcuts. All right. Now, wait, so after all this, why at first you declined joining the Manhattans and then you decided to go ahead and join, what motivated you to join the group? Well, actually, actually, that has been something I've been correcting for the past 50 mm -hmm. years. When the Manhattans came to, I went to, I was going to a junior college, Kittrell College, mm -hmm. in Kittrell, North Carolina, a suburb of Henderson. And the Manhattans were on tour with the Supremes. Gene Terrell was up front with the Supremes. And they were touring with the Supremes, and they had a couple of days in between that they were performing at some colleges and they performed at my college. And I had a group called Gerald Austin and the New Imperials. And we had our sound system. So my college professor came to me and asked me, could the Manhattans use my system? And I said, yes. So I left college, I went home, I got the system and I brought it back and I set it up. And I gotta tell you the song I was singing. Darling, oh, when we get married, 
we'll have a big celebration. They heard me singing that song and they walked in. And I remember the late Richard Taylor said, this is a godsend. And so they asked me if I wouldn't mind opening the show for them. So I opened the show with that particular song. And after the show, um, they took my name and number. And that was on a, like a Wednesday or Thursday night. And um, that Monday, I was flown into Dallas, Texas. But I never, I never did say that I didn't. I don't know where that came about, where I refused them. No, I never refused them. And um, I went to Dallas and watched the Manhattans perform for 10 days with the Supremes. I came back to New York and rehearsed for about two and a half weeks, three weeks. And I did my very first show in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia at the mosque with the Dells, Patty LaBelle in the Blue Bell, Cool in the Gang, Willie Feast and the Mighty Magnificence, the Spinners. And that place was jammed. And I was scared to death. <laughs> well, being on, not that you was on tour with all those legendary artists. Do you still remember just touring all those different states and looking back now, like, was you ever like on the tour, like, wait a minute, hold on, this is moving too fast. What's going on? Did you ever take a step back to say, yeah, you know what? I'm really blessed at this point. You know, I, I've always realized that I was blessed, you know, and um, because um, I know that I couldn't have done this myself. And um, my father was always there. He would always remind me, never forget where you came from. Never forget who blessed you with that voice, you know, and made it possible for you to do what you do. And um, I've gotten tired of traveling, you know, physically, you know, not tired of singing, but tired of traveling. Because when I first joined Manhattan's, we used to travel six days of the week. Uh, we worked like six days of the week. And maybe Sunday, we would be off somewhere on the road. I remember going out one year in May and we came back home. It was the end of August. We just kept going. We were traveling. And um, it, it was, I realized it was a blessing. And I realized even today when I look back that it was only God that helped me to make, gave me the strength to get through this for 52 years, you know, singing two and three nights out of the week, hour and a half, two hours at the cliff. That's a lot. And I'm thankful. So, you know, um, even though I would get tired sometimes, I would be home when the minute we were home and stayed in the length of time at home. I got house fever and I was ready to go back out. You know, so um, it was a blessing. It has been a blessing. That's just, and what's the, looking back, what's the, what was like the craziest thing that happened to you that you could, the funniest, craziest thing that ever happened while you were out on tour? Well, we were. <laughs> Vans want to know. They want to know about tour life because I know we, we always hear you guys go to state to state, but what's the craziest thing that has ever happened to you while on tour back then? I think one of the craziest things, there are quite a few things. We were in uh, Rotterdam and we were performing with the orchestra and um, the audience was packed. Everybody was dressed for them. And we were performing. And some way or another, I fell. And when I fell, I fell backwards. And my feet went up in the air. And my behind was facing the audience. And I could have gone through the floor. But I had a choice. Either I could have remained being embarrassed or get up and start singing. And I just got up and kept singing. But that was the mo one of the most embarrassing moments in my life. In a tuxedo, chop, ooh, clean, and fall down. It blew me away. 
what <laughs> what state would you say you like performing the most? What state do you say you like touring the most? Um, well, I love performing in the District of Columbia, the Washington area, Virginia, Maryland, and some of our wow, Atlanta, Georgia, um, New York, wow. New Jersey. You know, um, Boston. Oh my God, Chicago, Dallas. Um, that was in Houston. Oh my God. There were certain places that we performed like that, where the audience, they was just like waiting for you to come on stage. I, I see you had no Kansas City on there, but that's okay. That's cool. That's that's okay. That's, yeah, that's we did. suspicious. We did. Thank you. So, so yes, we did do Kansas City. I remember doing Kansas City. I can't remember the venue we played. It was it was jam packed. It was a big club we used to play in Kansas City, and then we had a convention. Um, when I became a Shriner, we had an Imperial Session in Kansas City, and we performed there with Whispers. And um, unbelievable! It was unbelievable. And um, but we we didn't. We never worked that much in Kansas City, but when we did work, it was off the chain. I must say. <laughs> that's okay. Don't don't worry. That's that's okay. I know Kansas City was popping back then. That's okay. That don't. Yeah. I, I get. I totally get. It. <laughs> don't worry. I sometimes I have artists say they will usually say on here, I ain't been in Kansas City in um twenty thirty years. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> so okay. I get. Not I get it. This. The last time that we performed in Kansas City, no, before we did the convention, we played outside and we were on stage and we had um, did the opening song and all of a sudden, darkness started coming to distance and terrible from the start. And we had we had to run off stage. It was a storm like I've never seen before. And um, I think we may have we performed maybe five minutes into the show, and we had to leave the stage. That was one of the worst storms I've ever seen. <laughs> but I was Dorothy. <laughs> Come on! Everybody ain't gotta say North Every time they say Kansas City, Kansas, I get it. I get it. I told someone, so a fan just said you didn't say Detroit either. LOL. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Detroit was another city. Oh my God! We used to play a place in Detroit. We played um, the arena downtown, and we played a place called Henry's Palace. It seated about 1,500 people. Oh my God, we lived in Detroit. We used to play Detroit for a 10 day stint and would sell out every night. Hold and up. then uh, we played Joe Lewis Arena. Then we played uh, Aniamos right outside of Detroit. And um, in fact, I just got a call from the promoter uh, wanting to book us back there. Uh, see there, okay. We got some Detroit people fans in here, so you gotta. They they'll let you know. You didn't say Detroit either. They'll let you know in a heartbeat. <laughs> like, yeah. but Detroit was honestly. It took us a minute to break the, the the get into Detroit because of Motown. Motown artists had it sold up, and finally when we got we broke the ice as the Manhattans in Detroit. It was on. It was on. Yes. Were there, since you said Motown, were there ever times you like said to yourself, man, I would like to be part of Motown, just, you know, with all those, everybody they had on the list? Oh, yes. Yes. I was on Motown back in 80, 87. But that was after Motown has, was not declining, but um, was going this transition. But I would have loved to have been with Motown, been on Motown back in the day. 
um, when I used to uh, work with Dennis, the late Dennis Edwards, and he would tell me about how recording and at, at Hitsville, how they were like um, family orientated. You know, they all worked together. They all would come and sing on different artists' and songs, you know. Um, and that's what made Motown because it was a family. And I wish that I could have been a part of that family. But I'm thankful, you know, we still got it going on. Oh, okay. And that's what's up. Shout out to all the people that fans watching Detroit. So you got a glimpse of Joe talking about Motel. But no. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, okay, so in your songs, Kiss and Say Goodbye and Shining Star, did you just say back there after recording and looking at now coming on, you know, me being a, you know, the success that the songs have had, did you ever think that the songs would become part of music history? Well, um, not Kiss and Say Goodbye. When we first, when we first, uh, record a kiss and say goodbye. Blue had actually written that song for a country and western artist. And um, so uh, Columbia decided to record it on us. And when and this is to show you about songs and tunes to show you the difference. Um, my vocal, lead vocal on on Kiss and Say Goodbye was a scratch vocal. I never put my complete, I never went back and did the actual real vocal over again. And some of the background parts weren't finished. They mixed it and released it. And we said, oh my God, they're trying to destroy us. And in April, 1976, we were in Atlanta, Georgia. Our manager called us and told us that Kiss and Say Goodbye had just gone gold. And um, um, and not after then, a few months later, maybe a few, yeah, but a few months later, it was platinum. And um, we never looked back. And and kiss and say goodbye to this day. Like you said, it's, it's uh, almost an anthem. We can't go any place and not sing that song. Even when I was solo, I could not go nowhere and not seeing Kiss and Say Goodbye. Well, when you say that kind of like those songs become, I had an artist that she said she wanted a career record. Would you say it became basically a career record? Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I just want to just briefly say something about career records. Career mm -hmm. records are records like Kiss and Say Goodbye, Me and Mrs. Jones, songs and like that that uh, artists get. And you may have hits after them, but you never have another one. Like that. Yeah. That's, that's a song that's like, just open the door to everywhere, you know? And um, in, in a sense it's good because you work hard to try to capture that same feeling or try to capture a song that will give you that same thing. So to keep you on your toes that you're trying to constantly write something good or better. And then we came out, then we, um, Shining Star was the next song, we won a Grammy. And believe it or not, both of those songs had the feeling of a country and western song. Both of them. But when you hear, I'm not gonna lie, when you hear Shining Star and any kind of message to that song? Anything, any message behind the song? Shining Star? That, yes. song, that song was written by Leo Graham and Paul Richmond. And Leo Graham was a success behind Tyrone Davis and Champagne. And um, when we first heard Shining Star, I was, I was the only one that it really got to. I, I loved it the first time I heard it. And um, guys, well, it may be okay. But then when we got to Chicago and actually heard the track and 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 started singing it, everybody fell in love with it. 
And um, that was one of our biggest, that was our one of our biggest pop records, uh, China Star. And um, it turned the table for us, it literally turned the table for us. And I remember that year when they could identify with it. And we, we delivered. But that was the change in our music in the 90s. So even with that, even just saying, it's crazy how record labels always wanted to basically change up your appearance to go on whatever, like disco. Okay, they want you all to be more disco-ish, but it's not like, no, you, they want to change up a look, a style, a sound. And did you just think like, come on, like we don't fit that. It's not us. We fit this over here. Exactly. Exactly. I remember um, we were on tour with Dell, and I was talking to a late Marvin Jr. And Marvin said um, at that time, the label they were with was trying to, wanted them to do something um, well, different, like what was happening then. Disco. Marvin said, can you imagine Adele singing disco and, and me or Johnny trying to rap? And I said, no, you know, but that's what he was saying. The point that he was making is that it wasn't who we are, you know. Um, we could have, we did up tempo stuff and, and songs that move people could move with, but it wasn't our thing. Our thing was who we are, you know. Um, and if you notice that when music moved into the 90s, everybody started singing alike. All the artists tried to sing like the other artists who had the big record or who could do the biggest, the most runs in a record. And we lost the art of real singing for a while there. And some of the artists back then, a lot of the artists, even today, have great voices, but a lot of them at the time was like, I can do 25 riffs in this bar, you know? And what I've learned over the years that I've been singing is that no matter who you are, the audience like to be able to sing along with you. Yay. That's true. Important. No, that is true. There's a lot of times I go to concerts and literally the uh, artists can put the microphone out and uh, you know fans are up for singing to their song, know the, every bit of the word, you know, because it's just that song, it's a particular song, particular music, and that whoever is singing that song. But no, I agree. It wouldn't like, do you think sometimes that sometimes the record label, record company, they got it wrong? You know, um, music goes in a cycle and the record company, they change with the times. Whatever's happening in that time, if they got an artist that's singing a song and it hits, they will, and, and it fits in a groove, they will continue that, you know, um, because it's making them money. Not like it was, and, and it happened in the 90s, because in the 70s, 80s, early 80s, um, we had an image, and the artists and the companies tried to give you that image. They wanted you to maintain your image. In the ni in 90s, and, and up to date, we've lost image. You know, um, you dressed, we came on stage, we were fashionably dressed. Um, now it's not a fashion no more. Either you wear an outright costume or you come on and you look like the next person on the street. <laughs> you know, but um, the, the artist development has is no longer, does no longer exist in America. It no longer exists. All they care about, the bottom line, is that and whatever makes them the best, they don't really particularly care what the artists look like or how they sound about making that money. Tell people what artist development is because they had that during the Motown days. You can tell the way they look, the songs, you know, on stage. They taught you everything. You know, um, they they had a, of course, I think Pop used to use a glamour school at Motown where they taught the ladies how to make up and 
just how to carry themselves. And I remember when I worked with the Supremes, I, I remember being just about the same height as Mary Wilson, and she looked like a giant to me. When they dressed up and walked out on that stage, they looked elegant, they looked bigger than life. And, and that's what artist development is all about, making the artist look bigger than life making the artists um, bring their best to you, you know? And it's today it's not like that. It's just not. No, I say today is more about it's the branding over a talent. I've heard an artist say that. I was in Clubhouse and they asked her a question. A singer said, it's, now it's more about the branding over the talent. Like they're so busy worrying about the brand. I'm like, what about the talent? The talent is what either they're going to last long or they're not. Because now I ain't going to lie. If you look at from the past five years ago, singers that was out five years ago, Okay, they're not out no more. It's but it's too busy now. The young girls, you got a few more rappers. It's all about the style, what they look like. I'm like, what about the talent? Where's the talent? I want to like, is where's the talent in in, in who they are? Where is that at? Exactly. And and the best thing I can answer, best way I can answer that is this year, this past August, we celebrated 60 years, and we didn't celebrate 60 years by being a brand, just being a brand. Well, now, I mean, we are, we are brand, we perform, and we were taught honest development. We were given honest development, how to carry ourselves on stage, how to write songs and not tunes, how to make every person in that audience sing like I'm singing to you as an individual, how to reach out and touch our artists, um, our fans, um, how, to, when you're off stage, how to be humble, how to shake hands, how to sign autographs, how to take pictures, how to be all of that. Because um, today is, is just not that. And this is how, this is a true brand. But let's put it this way. 60 years is a true brand. The Shy Lights, 64 years, a true brand. Russell Tompkins and the Stylistics, a true brand, you know, we and the whispers brand, the OJs, a true brand, you know, this is what it is. And um, we got this from artist development, learning how to be humble, most of all, and be true to who we are. You know, yeah. that gratification, yes, some of the artists, they make a lot of money, but they spend a lot of money, you know, um, being lavish and 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 buying things. You know, it, it slips right through their hands, like it's going to continue to come forever. There's some artist that has it did very well from that era, but a lot of them just comes in his hand, out of that hand, you know. And at the end of the day. They're only as good as their last record. That's the sad thing. They're only as good as their last record. If they sold 10 million copies of an album and come back and um, sell a million, they're dropped. Huh. You know, it's not important to the record company. They got to come back and do either the same or top what they just did. And their lifetime their lifespan as an artist is like you said. They're here today, gone tomorrow. Yep. Most definitely. No, that is true. They are here today and gone tomorrow. If, or you basically, if you notice, some of them have to go do something stupid to be still recognized. Go go do something to tarnish your brain. Go be out there. Go do something on social media or say the wrong thing. And now it's all, since social media is out, it's all about what they say, what they look like, or what they're doing. If they say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, that's the end of their career. Or they have to sit there and start from the bottom and go out and start in just to climb back up. They have to take baby steps. But no, it's today's generation is, is crazy. You can tell tell the difference of true singers back then compared to artists now. You can, you can tell a big difference. Even for that, 
for you singing, how did that transition happen for you being in a group and then make your way over to being a solo artist? Well, um, there was a point in, uh, I've always wanted to have a solo career, but there was a point when we worked so much, we didn't have time to rehearse like we wanted to, and we were getting satisfied with just what we were doing. And I needed a change. And so I had the opportunity to do a solo project, and I did. And it was very gratifying to me, and I learned a lot. I learned that fans love what they love. And they loved me as a solo artist. And I sang all around the world as a solo artist. But I still had to sing Manhattan's tunes. And I realized that I was a Manhattan regardless where I performed as a solo artist. I remember in um, I played Rio with, Vanette, with Vesta Williams. And um, we performed... And after I did all my new songs from my new project, solo project, they, at the end of the show, they started hollering, they want more. I came back on stage and they started hollering for me to sing, it feels so good to be loved so bad. There's no me without you. Kiss and say goodbye. I kind of miss you. And I sang all those songs, a piece of them, acapella until they were satisfied. So, you know, um, it, it's, it's a lot to be said for that. But that's how it be though. Honestly, like, even when anybody who goes solo, the fans are still gonna remember even being in a group because they still wanna hear that music, that song and everything. So that's like, you, like you said, you, you're never gonna leave the Manhattan. There was no way that was gonna happen, but it's good to know that the fans, like you gave them like, okay, let me go ahead and give them what they're requesting. Because you know what fans, if you don't give them what they're requesting, it's just like, uh-uh, ain't no way you're getting off that stage. Not even, no. <laughs> yeah, so you gotta give the fans what they, what they want. And the fans, you know what? Actually, I hate to say it. Fans are always right. They know what they want. They know what to expect from the artist. And they know what they want to hear. Yes. I, had, I remember we were in Detroit at Henry's Cocktail Lounge. And um, when I, um, that's my son's last night. We were at Henry and um, we were singing Don't Take Your Love From Me. And this guy from the audience knocked on our dressing room door. And we invited him in, you know. He was just admiring the show and tells how he enjoyed the show. He said, but can I, can I really tell you something? Uh, give, you know, make a suggestion. And he gave me an idea of singing Don't Take Your Love From Me. And I took his, his suggestion. I went back on the next show. We had two shows that night did exactly what he said, turn the place out. And that's when I realized that fans know what they want to hear. And you got to give it to them. You have to give it to them. And um, whenever I hear um, criticisms, before I get angry and say, they don't know what they talk about, uh, I listen, I take what I can take from it. And make if it works for me, I'll do it. If it doesn't, I'll let it go. But you, you're Someone. right. They know what they want. Yes, they do. Someone just said Henry's Cocktail Lounge and bust out laughing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was, it was, first it was called Henry's Cocktail Lounge. Uh -huh. Then he changed it when he uh, enlarged the place, he changed it to Henry's Palace. All right. And, uh, I've had some good times. Oh my God, I got to tell you this. We played Henry's. Dallas. And just as kiss and say goodbye, it went gold. We were in Atlanta. We went into Detroit. And usually the um, <laughs> guys from the school, if they were there, they would come in. And this particular night, um, Lou Rawls was there. 
And Blue, we did a part of the song where we would invite artists to come up and sing to end up with. And Lou Rawls came, in, oh my God, in that deep voice. And he killed it. And when he finished, Blue uh, said, I looked at Blue and said, what am I supposed to do behind this? <laughs> Lou Rawls, I mean, in that baritone voice, he just came over and took the stage. And it was on, it was on. <laughs> And, and then happened, now, it happened to us at the front row with Eddie LeBert. Eddie came on stage, we introduced him, and he came on stage. And we were doing Kiss and Say Goodbye. He said, man, I don't know that song. I said, just sing what you feel. And it seemed like something came over Eddie. And he stood on one side of the stage. I stood on the other side. And we were back and forth. And those people went berserk. They love it. And, uh, right. you know, it's, I, I think about those great things like that to happen. You know, that's, that's when music was music. Yeah. Tell us a story now, even for that, but give your experience appearing on shows like Soul Train and Showtime at the Apollo. We talked about that early, right before the show started, how TV is not TV anymore. Those kind of shows you don't get. It's like being black, going on Showtime at the Apollo on Saturday mornings. You know it comes on the 12. Well, I told you my time is 12 o'clock. You get on there and just to have be in the presence, just being on Soul Train, back then was Soul Train was Soul Train. Yes, I remember. Now, I'm going to take you away from we did Soul Train when they were in Chicago. And hold up. <laughs> that was the first time we did Soul Train. Then we did it in 1973. And um, we, I remember distinctly, I, I remember so very well um, doing it. It was like, um, Unbelievable. We When we did it in 1973, it was like, we have made it. We're on Soul Train. And everybody watched Soul Train in the Black community, especially. Everybody watched Soul Train. That was, that was, the, that was the, one of the highest honors we had, we could have had at that particular time in our career. And when I did it, um, I did it as when, when I was solo as well. And that's when I met Arsenio for the first time. And um, it, it was like um, Soul Train was, was Don Cornelius was, is an icon. Soul Train um, is, a, is a show that will always be remembered. Always, always. It opened the door for so many artists' career. The Apollo Theater. I did, I won three weeks in a row at the Apollo Theater Amateur Hour. And um, I won, then I, after my, besides winning the money, I won a week to perform at the Apollo Theater. Oh my God. Hey, yeah, we like to take it back over here. I, that's, I had to hit you with it. <laughs> oh my god oh rita and edna oh my god wow you already know that's how we do it that's how old school tuesday do it to a artist do it so you artists take your bag so you can see really see yourself on these shows yes i remember that oh my god oh my god and it was honestly, I believe it was either take me where you want to, I believe, or um, take me where you want to, or send for me. I think it was take me where you want to. Yes. It might have been so close. Because I did, when I did, I did three songs. Uh, uh -huh. 
Oh God, I remember doing it. And and, and um, I can't remember if that was the particular at the time. And the two ladies in the back, Rena, she's on the left, and my, my now my wife is on the right. Um, on my left, facing north. Um, I remember that like yesterday. Oh my God. Oh. Uh, so one of the ladies is actually your wife as of today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's, well, I, I could show you, but the film is frozen. But she's, um, with me facing the audience, she was on my left. And um, behind me. And, um, the and song you're singing is I Can't Tell You Why. That's the song you're singing. You're singing. Oh Oh, yes. yes. Oh my God. So which one is yes. your wife? Which one? Which on one was she? The, the one on the right screen, uh, facing her. She's on the right hand side. The right hand side. Okay. Yeah. Facing she goes. Looking... That's why I asked. Oh, for she real? That's why I asked. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why I asked what she watching tonight. That would have been funny for her to be watching like, wait a minute, is that me back there? <laughs> now you know, when you get off of here, you're going to tell her like, wait a minute, you know they show a video of me yes. at the show Apollo, you were back there in the back? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, you like to take saw, it back. When my son saw this video, he looked at it, he said, Mom, is that you? You're like... He couldn't believe it was, it was her. But um, yeah, she did. Pop had her. She was um, like our uh, assistant to Pop. When Once we learned the choreography, she would uh, go over it. That's her right there. And she would uh, maintain the choreography for us. All she right. Was just, just as rough as Pop. Oh, my God. <laughs> That was at Morgan State. Woo. Graduation. My son graduated tomorrow. Our son. Gosh. Does she still sing? Does she still sing? Uh, no, no. She, my, my wife really is a dancer. And um, um, she was, when we did that show, we needed some background singers. And all my background singers wasn't there. She knew the choreography and she knew the song. So she just stepped in. That's what's up. That's beautiful. That is so beautiful. I know now you got something to tell her tonight. Like, man, they showed you the show time at Apollo. We was back singing back then. Like, and I can't tell you why was the song was the song you were yes. before me. Oh my God. Yes. And um, because like I said, I did three songs that night. Um mm -hmm. and oh my God, I can't tell you why. That's one of my favorite songs. I've always loved that song. Did you ever get scared of, uh, you know, Showtime at the Apollo has a uh, Sandman to come out and everything? Because, you know, the Apollo, the Apollo audience. Yes. When I did that, for some reason, I wasn't cocky, but I knew that Sandman was, I just knew he wasn't going to come out for me. And I did, <laughs> um, I sang A Change Is Gonna Come. Mm. And and I sang it for three weeks and got a standing ovation every night. Every night. I remember that. And That's funny cold, there was a gentleman that worked at the, it used to be Heinz, um, Atkins and Coles. Honey, uh, Honey Coles and Charlie Atkins danced together. They were a duet. And they tap danced together, they danced together. Um, if you if you get a chance to to Google them, you'll see them, and they are, were a team. And um, it's so ironic because Honeycoast took to me like Pop did. And um, at that time, I didn't know Pop Atkins. I knew uh, Honeycoast at the Apollo. And um, that week that um, I performed, I had um, bought a couple of suits. Honey Cole said, you need some shirts. Let me take you out. He took me out front. And, you know, on 125th Street, you can get anything. 
he bought me like four or five shirts to wear that matched my suits. And I'll never forget that. And, um, and I remember people saying he was a nice guy, but you must have been special for him to do that to you. And um, I really appreciate that. I look back and I, I think back on that. That was the beginning of my career. That was the door, that, uh, that the thing that opened the door to my career. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking, with all your success and everything, how about when are we, as the fans gonna be able to see this, the Manhattans, your story play out in a movie? And if so, what kind of story would you want told? You know, it's, it's a lot. I've been working on that. Secret is out. I've been working on that. And um, we've been putting different things together. Um, it's, it's so many people that was involved in our career. And um, I just spoke to a gentleman that was in the group before I got in the group. And he worked as, as our dresser and we're, well, wardrobe master. And um, he brought a lot of ideas and things to me that I didn't know from the beginning. That it's just a whole lot. But we are working on that. And hopefully in a few years, it will come to fruition. You know, maybe not a few years, but years. Oh my God. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been taking it back with you on the devil. I'm gonna take it back. I like to see the reaction on your faces. That's what I like. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh. All these Louis, look how Ooh. young. Yeah. You you know yeah. that was in Japan, I believe. Trying to start with. That was at the Tokyo Music Festival. We had won and we were performing there on tour afterwards. And that was one of the television shows. Yeah. Oh my God. You are blown me away. <laughs> well, that's that's what I do. That's what I like to do. I like to take you all back because I see it as honestly, Gerald, fans they go to your concert and they see you artists perform, and so do I. And we only get to watch you perform almost two hours, give or take, you know. And if you're there with other groups, you might be on stage in 30, well, 45 minutes to an hour, let's say per se. And once the fan, then once you get off that stage, that is it. We no longer, the fans do not hear no more, no more about their favorite artists or unless they're putting out new music or you're in a radio interview, but they never get to really interact to see to ask questions like fan, you know, the fans are doing right in they're making comments right now while we're talking. But also not only that, we never get to see you all be asked questions or what was it like being on Showtime at the Apollo or Soul Train or, you know, or Dick Clark or whatever. It, it, they don't get to ask the questions. They don't get to see your response or see your reaction when they, you see a picture of yourself or see you in a video from way back in the day. You're like, oh, shoot, like, wait a minute like dang you're yeah. so that's what i like when I, I do here on old school tuesday turn up i like to take the artists back just to see you all's reaction yeah this is what your show is all about the fans can ask questions and it, you know what they want to know um and they get a chance to um to write in the chat to ask a question in the chat and we can answer it, you know <clears throat> This is what we need. This is the positive side of social media. Having us, um, you know, on the show, um, when, when the positive side of social media is that people filming your show live on Facebook and Instagram, is that the audience around the world still know that you are still alive and people. That's the good part, yes. you know, and um, and it's that's a blessing to us. Because um, a while back, the, the people were saying, what, are the Manhattan still singing? Are they still together? And, and then now that our presence is all over social media, that's an advantage for me. That's a true advantage for me. 
Yes. And not only that, you said like Soul Train and Don Curtin, you know, he, he was an icon. You know, for me, I want that same thing. B, I want old school Tuesday Turner to become what Soul Train was for Don Cornelius. And so old school Tuesday Turn Up is what it is for Priscilla Wiley. One day it will become the show that was that had all the legends. It become its own legend, its own icon. But that's what I want for this show and everything. Like we said earlier, we talked about Arsenio Hall behind the scenes and talked about, uh, I was telling you about Arsenio Hall show. Shows like that, you don't get late night anymore to see artists come over and see or we talked about, you know, Donnie Simpson, Video Soul and all those shows. You don't get shows like that no more. And you're right. Like shows like this, I get to go and get artists like this and get you all to come on here and interact with your fans and see pictures and videos to really take it back. And you will. And I like it. You're at home and, and you get to really see yourself in a light to where they appreciate like hey, these people. This She really appreciate what we had did in the past. Like, that's what's up. Exactly. And you know, your show um, is keeping us alive. You know, and uh, we we truly, we truly, truly appreciate you and what you are doing for our music. What, what, and and believe me, you stay the course. Keep God first, and stay the course. And I promise you, you will get as far as you can. The blessings will just keep coming. The blessings will keep coming. You know, and uh, I have a few friends I want to ask about. I'd like to try to see, can I get to connect with you and do your show? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's why I I appreciate you artists, the fans, and just they, I mean, everyone makes what Old School Tuesday turn up. It's just, it's just that show. It's that show. And it uh, comes when it can arrive two years ago. I'll be starting in January season three. More people will come on, but I like it where I get to it's about you all giving me your time and allowing me to interview you. That's what, you know, that's, you know, I love about you all. And I care about the artists that I have on. So I appreciate you being here. The fans are loving you here. And we, like we said, said earlier, we talked about the new, the new generation. What do you think about for the direction where R&B music is now going? You know, it, it has changed so much. Um, it's 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 the industry. I just have to put it right where where it is. It's the industry. We change, music change, and um, the style of music, the production. Oh my God! All of this changes, you know. And the direction is going in is what's happening now, you know. Um, and um, sometimes in for us, it's okay, and then sometimes it doesn't work so good for us. You know, we have to be matched with certain artists out here to work with and um, to make it happen, you know, um, but we're still here. I, I don't, I can't knock it, is what's happening today, and it's what, what's what making the money, <laughs> let's face it, and, um, it's just that I don't think the longevity is here with this with the music today. You know, um, that's what's missing the longevity. You know, mm -hmm. and plus, no artist, every artist is as sincere about doing this the way I am, the way we were back in the seventies and the eighties and early nineties, even today. This is what I do. This is what I love. And I love singing. And I love singing from my heart. Period. You know, I love expressing myself to my fans. Period. That's what I'm talking about. So, do you think artists should own their masters? Yes. Yes. Why? Yes. They should own their masters because as years pass, when you when you don't own your masters, you hear all these commercials on television playing your song, and you don't own the master. You may get a roll to check for being a performer, but how much more can you get if you own the master? 
you know, um, and that's a, that's very important. That is very, very important. That artists own their masters. Um, and since I've been doing, I've been recording independently. We own all of that. I own all of that that I record. Um, even the songs that I have uh, recorded again, remakes. You know, the masters of the remakes are mine. You know, and um, that's that's very important. That's very important because the songs that I have that I did, I can put in commercials, have to put them, do them in commercials, whatever, and, and I will be paid my residuals. I don't have to worry about the record company did it or somebody else did it for me, and they want this percentage. You know. Um, so it's very important. It's very important. And a lot of artists today, are, you know, own their masters, have their own. But that's an advantage. So can you imagine having your masters today and having someone that will be forever played, you know, just as good today as it did back in the day? <clears throat> you know. It's, it's, it's so much to be said. And so did you see where they said about uh, ABC News, he interviewed CeCe Peniston and they talked about the royalties. And like you said, so you've, I know some artists, they have to now have to, they talked about Taylor Swift, one of her songs that she had to go re re-record over and then they use a sample of it for a movie. Now she's being paid the right way. And I know you just said you've already, so, You've already re-recorded "Kiss and Say Goodbye" and "Shawnee Star." You have to go back in and re-record it. No, I did it over again. Um, I oh. actually recorded on a solo project, and then we did a live version in South Africa. Okay. And the version that I used the South African version, and um, so and it's all of my musicians playing is our master, you know. Um, and we get residuals. We get residuals, from that. but um, it's 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 just rough. And I understand why it was to to go back because it's it's so. This is the point. There's so many things in contracts where a record company will give you something here, and two paragraphs down below that, they're taking it back, mm -hmm. or they have a way. Where they're maneuvering, where they you don't get it, it's, it's just so much. And so many artists going blind back in the day when they would get um, advances, and not knowing that that advance that you got from the record company is recoupable. So if you get two hundred thousand dollars before you get any residual on a record that you recorded, they gonna take their $200,000 200, back and their percentage of what they get of your record before you get a dime. You know, so that's why it's important that um, you own your masters and own as much of your work as possible. The publishing, your writing, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very important. And I always tell artists today, upcoming artists, learn about the business study the business, know the business, you know, and that'll put your head of the game. Someone had asked, has said earlier, has any new artists sampled any of your music? Um, yes, I can't remember the artist's name, but I just, um, um, my son was showing me again, don't take your love from me. I forgot the artist that did it. But he's doing a rap, and he's and you could hear me singing in the background. And of course, there's a wrong. <laughs> hey, I ain't bad. <laughs> All right. Oh, it feels so good to be loved so bad. I um, was done. I, I haven't really. I just look at the checks when they come, you know. And, and uh, I appreciate the artists doing it, but I look at the right. checks. Yeah. That 
Hey, that's not wrong. Not wrong with that. Not wrong with that. Since we get ready to go out for 2022, what is something that you have learned in this whole entire year looking back? I've learned more patience. Um, I've learned to listen more. I've learned to appreciate what God has blessed me with even more. And um, I learned even more about showing more appreciation to my fans. You know, I'm looking at all of the, um, the chats that are coming up on this, you know, and, and people are, are making comments and saying, it's a blessing. And, you know, um, I've just, it just inspired me to do more of who I am, to be humble, you know, um, and, and treat people the way you want to be treated. And most of all, um, be as humble as I can to my fans, to my peers, to you, to everybody. You know, you have this show. Um, and it's an honor, and I'm glad, and I'm thankful that you got in touch with me to do this show. I think Marshall called me first, I believe. Yes, Marshall called me. And um, But I'm, I'm happy to be able to share my time with you. And, and, and I want you to know, and my fans to know, um, and this is what a lot of artists need to accept and understand. You are not doing your fans a favor by performing for them. They are doing you a favor by coming to see you perform. So you should respect them, give them all the praise and the glory and be humble to them because they are who make you who you are. The lie detector test determined you are telling the truth. It's uh yes, I love that. It was R Swift that is simple, don't take your love. Right, right, right. Yes. Well, so Go ahead, I'm sorry. What did, what would you say 2023 is getting ready to hit in here in a couple of days? What's one thing you wanna really do in 2023? One thing you still want to do. One thing I still wanna do is um, a residency in Las Vegas for the Atlantic City. And keep bringing great music, recording great music. And um, I, I think, I wanted, um, how should I say this, without um, people getting the wrong impression. I want to work more but at my leisure, I want to mm. be able to pick and choose a little more instead of just working every weekend, working every weekend, working every weekend. You know, um, I want to be able to, to work at my leisure and enjoy, continue to enjoy. And you know, I, I got to do something. I have to give a shout out to East Coast Connection, my musicians, to our sound people, uh, uh, Andre Borg and Tom Selsey and Jeffrey Scott to Edna to all the people that work to make us who we are, you know, um, because I can't exist without them. Um, without what they do for me, how they encourage me, how they support me, you know. And what I love about my organization is their truth. You know, they don't tell me what I want to hear. If I have a bad night, oh boy, you didn't sound good at all tonight. What's your problem? You know, I love that because it gives me something to work for. And uh, also to my fans, thank you. I just want to uh, over and over again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh boy, you missed. <laughs> what does? I know, right? And that's what I'm talking about. Oh, what does 
Joe Austin want his legacy to be? I want to be remembered, my legacy to be, that I am, first of all, a humble person, a person that uh, on legacy in music that I've always wanted to leave the legacy of singing songs and singing from the heart. And that when anybody listen to any song that I've ever performed, they'll know that they're getting the real Gerald Austin. And um, I just want to leave that thing. Yes. Someone asked, um, a fan just asked, um, are you putting out any new music and are you recording with any other R&B artists? Not at the moment, but we are going to, we're going back into the studio. Um, we've had a rough year. Um, we've lost one of our singers, Dave Tyson, um, and he's, we have a new replacement. Um, Lawrence Newton, and he stepped in and he's doing a wonderful job. Um, and you know, it's we lost Dave in February, and um, each personality I don't know, he just gave something to the show to our show that was him, everybody's own personality. And unfortunately, we lost him. And um, but Lawrence has come in. And he's just brought so much more energy to the group again because it was it took us a minute because when Dave passed, he was in perfect condition when we left Las Vegas. And two days later after we left Las Vegas, um, he had a seizure and never came out of it. And, oh, wow. Um, but, um, you know, we miss him. And um, he was... He was he was just a big part of our show, you know. And Lawrence stepped in, and he's on it. He's on it. But we will be recording. We're in the process of putting together new material to record for 23. And I'm also going to do another gospel album in 23. All right. Do you have any shows already booked for next year in 2023 since your fans are watching so they know to come see you? Yeah, let me see. Can I get them up top, mate? I'm going to Atlanta in January. Hey! Um, I'm doing, yeah. And I, I did a Sam Cooke album, tribute album. And on the 17th of February, um, I'll be performing a solo concert, a tribute to Sam Cooke at the Ritz Theater in Jacksonville, ten, Jacksonville um, Florida. And um, the, Ritz, the Ritz Choir will be singing with me. They sang back up for me on my gospel. And um, then we're going to Jamaica. Um, we're going back to the Birchmere in April. I mean, May, May 12th, we're back at the Birchmere. This is off the top of my head. April 22nd, we're in Baltimore. We, we got dates scattered. And I wish I had them written down. But, um, you can go to our website. Let's just kiss and say goodbye. And um, you can find out from there. In fact, I'm going to, I'm, I'll be updating the site uh, ASAP so you can get all of our dates. All right. And where can the fans find you at on social media? We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. And our website is uh, let's just kiss and say goodbye.com. All right. I think also in 2023, since you said Atlanta, but I think some point in 2023, I think you need to meet this young lady named Priscilla Watley. She's the host of Old School Tuesday Turn Up. I think she'll be also be great for your movie as well. But I think next year, I think you need to like meet her. I, I, I remember somebody talking to me about her. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. That, that, I, just, I love when I throw myself out there to you all. Like, I think, I think, I see, I speak this in the future, Gerald, that you will meet Priscilla Wadley. I, I, I see that in the future. Oh! 
I, I'm looking forward to it. V2, V2. Is there, how, can I get you to say a message to, right now you're alive, to other solo artists from the, uh, you know, past groups, get some, just to get them to come on Old School Tuesday turn up. And I have had some people that, you know, they just, you know how people are, but what kind of message you would get to them right now? What, what would you say to them? I would like to say to them that you have a platform. Priscilla Watley has a platform that let the people know, our fans know, that we still exist and that our music is just as good today as it was yesterday. So I would ask all my peers, um, the stylistics, Marshall already been to your show, Marshall Tompkins, the OJs, the dramatics, you know, um, Enchantment, Ray Goodman and Brown, you know, Blue Magic, all these artists that I've worked with, um, and I'm sure there's some I left out, but I would say to them, please, 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 if you have the opportunity, please do Miss Watley's show because um, we need this and you give us a platform that we can talk to and that we can talk about ourselves and not just talk about our music. Our fans can even learn more about us and who we are. You have a wonderful platform. And I would say to all of my peers, if you have this opportunity, please take it. Started Thank from you. the bottom, now we're here. <laughs> Started from the bottom, now my whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Thank you so much, Drew. Now that portion of the interview is over. You no, know, like that's the whew, we got that. But there's a portion. If you ever seen Steve Harvey's show, uh, Family Feud, I do Old School Tuesday Turn Up Feud, where I ask you ten questions, yeah. sixty seconds, and I ask you real quick these real quick questions. You just you just go whatever on top of your head, whatever on top of your head. Okay. All right, top way. Let's start the music. It's gonna be good. I like to have fun with my artist. <laughs> So we can learn a little bit more about you. Okay. All right. Favorite ice cream. Vanilla. Favorite dish. My favorite dish is I like red beans and rice. Favorite movie. Favorite movie. Would have to. Oh my God! You got me next. If I can name part of it, I'm a Clint Eastwood fan. And my favorite Fa movie is Dirty Air. Favorite comedian. Favorite comedian was Richard Pryor. Favorite love song. My favorite love song was one that um, we recorded called You're My Life. Favorite color. Favorite word. I'm sorry. Color. My favorite color, it's, um, I would say blue. Sunrise or sunset? Oh I love the sunrise. Chicken or ribs? Chicken. Chicken, uh, grits with sugar or grits with salt? Grits with salt. Ow. All right, all right, last question. Name one artist. So an artist that's a male and a female, and name one group you would like to see come on Old School Tuesday Turn Up. Wow, I would love to see um, Russell Thompson. Okay. Um, female, oh my God. You know who would knock black dead is Gladys Knight. Oh, oh. oh. God. Yes. So, Russell from the Style Lakes, Gladys Knight in the group. Who you want for a group? For a group? Um, no, Russell. Oh, female group? Both. Male and female oh. girl. Let's do it. Okay, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. You know what would... I know I'm going to say this. I would like to, because I've seen them 
at the Stella Awards. I would like to see um, Destiny's Child as a group on the show. Okay, okay. Male group. Who would you like to see as a male group on the show? As a male group, hmm. actually, other than me, other than my group. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You already know. <laughs> yeah. um, male group, I would like to see the Dells. They're retired. But I would love for you to have the two members of the Dells on your show. Nikki I like those answers. Brian. Okay, that, that's what I talk. I love I love those answers. I like those answers. That was a good we'd have had everybody always gave different I like to see just to see you all's response. I like that we all and all the groups that you had listed, the stylistics, the Dales, hopefully the dramatics and blue magic, hopefully we can get them all here for next for next year, for 2023. And not only that, but before I go, someone in the beginning had asked about the in, in Henderson NC Finest, what is that? Well, I am one of the few artists that came from Henderson that has been successful. And um, Benny King um, and I, who else? Yeah, Benny King and myself. Um, and my, my hometown lifted me up and and that's the way they feel about me you know I um we have a new venue there that we played over the years every other year and has been sold out every every time and um, I'm honored to be innocence finest to represent my hometown all right that's what i'm talking about all those groups now all the groups you sit there and list it what would you think about doing like a battle like they do now the verse battle what would you think about if they were to come swiss beast or timely comes you all and do like a verse battle oh i would love it i would love it you know because we had when we were touring together on the road um we had those battles you know they were, um, we would get together and, and we would say, we're going to make it hot for you or whatever. And we would have those battles. And it was it was very good because each one of us made the other sing. <laughs> you know, if you come out in front of me, I can't go out there and let the audience down. I got to come out there and do something else. Now, I'll tell you something. Years ago, I've heard in an interview that Gladys uh, was having one time when she was with the Pips. They were too hot on stage. They weren't quite big enough to close, but they were too hot of an act to come on before you. So the headliners would literally catch hell when Gladys Knight and the Pips came on stage, you know? Um, but they were just that awesome. And she's still awesome. And I take my hat off to it. Yes. All right. All right, Nick. What are you doing? I, I got to ask, what you doing for New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve, I will be spending time with uh, my niece. She just moved to Virginia. And uh, my cousin's getting married. It's a twofold thing. My cousin, young cousin, is getting married. So I'm going to his wedding. And then we're going to spend the New Year's Eve with my niece. I just bought a new home, and we're going to spend New Year's Eve with family and have prayer and just thank God for another year. That's what I'm talking about. Well, you know, Gerald, thank you for being here on episode 46, the last Tuesday of the year, the last episode of the year. Thank you to Marshall Thompson for hitting you up telling you to come on here and thank you for you know reaching out to you and thank him for we because he said we asked him and he said i'm gonna go talk to gerald gerald i'm gonna get gerald on the show i'm like i'm like heck yeah let's do it like and here you are you are two weeks later and you're here you're the very yep. last person 
I want to thank Marshall too because Marshall always look out. Whenever there's an opportunity that he thinks that I would like or we beneficial for beneficiary for me, he called me up and he give it to me. You tell me. You have a person get in touch with me or have me get in touch with them. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Marshall. Yes. What is one thing, what is one advice that you have learned from Marshall Thompson? You know, um, I've learned to stay the course. You know, believe in yourself and stay the course. And that's what, what I, I, I get from Marshall and I learned from Marshall. Marshall believes in himself and he stays the course. You know, and, and I feel the same exact way. And he'll try it one time, regardless. He will try it one time. The opportunity opens for him, try it at least. And he'll give it his best. Mm. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Gerald, thank you so much being on Old School Tuesday Turn Up, episode 46. And thank you all. Don't go nowhere. We're going to talk to you behind the show. But thank you all. This has been one heck of a 2022. We done had, I think, I don't, it's too many episodes, Marshall. We done did everybody. But one thing for sure and one thing for certain, I know, we turned it up tonight with the one and only Mr. Gerald Austin from the Manhattans. You all go see him next year. If he's in your city, go see him. You got to. I know I am. I can't wait to meet you next year in person. I'm putting that, I'm speaking, I'm putting that out there in the future. I'm, I'm going to see. We're going to meet. We're going to meet each other next year. And you all have a safe, happy new year to all of you all. Have a safe New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. I'll see you all next year in January when we kick off season three of Old School Tuesday Turn Up. That's right. We ain't going nowhere. Gerald, we're not going anywhere. The show is going to keep going. It's not going. We're not going anywhere. It's, yes. And Gerald, is, any, is there anything you want to say to your fans before we get up out of here? Anything you want to say to them? I'd just like to say to all of my fans, thank you so very much for your many years of support and uh, standing by us. And we will continue to bring you great music as long as God give me my health and strength. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because... My theme song is There's No Me Without You, and that is the gospel. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, yes. Gerald, do you like to dance? I know you said your wife, do you like to dance? We can, we can already no. drop the music. We can dance no. in the chair. We, no. not, like, not get up and dance. Not get up there. But Top Boy's about to drop this music, and we're going to dance our way up out of here. All right. This, 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 you all happy new year thank you all for being here at episode 46 i will see you all next year for season three in january you guys just have a safe new year i'm priscilla wiley the old school tuesday turn up and that's your all from manhattan we had a, we just turned it up tonight you all happy new year you all, 2023.